So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Brookings event, uh, where we'll be discussing the new book uh, published by Norm Eisen and his wonderful Brookings co-authors on Democracy's Defenders. Um, holding on the book now, it is available now from the Brookings Institution Press. Uh, before uh, we get into the, the deep of it, I want to start it off with uh, my former Brookings colleagues and one of the authors of the book, uh, Norm Eisen. Norm, let me hand it over to you for a quick intro and then we'll head straight into the conversation. Uh, thank you, Alina, and welcome, uh, Alina and Jeff. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to join everyone today uh, to uh, present uh, and discuss the implications of uh, my new volume, Democracy's Defenders. You should be able to see a link to purchase a copy of the book if you are so inclined at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, the book stems from uh, my service uh, in Embassy Prague uh, from 2011 to 2014, uh, and my discovery of the rediscovery of the incredible story uh, of the peaceful transition of power in 1989 in then Czechoslovakia, the so-called Samatove Revolutse, the Velvet Revolution, uh, and the role of the United States Embassy of American diplomacy, fulfilling the historic mission, uh, the privilege that we as American diplomats had uh, enjoyed for so many decades of leading democracy and how very low key, subtle and in the background, uh, the American embassy did so much to make that revolution velvet. I was so interested that I got uh, over 50 cables describing the embassy's role declassified. And this new book contains those cables seeing the light of the day uh, for the first time ever, uh, together with an introduction, a lengthy introduction, putting the cables in context, explaining how we got to that point, and a uh, long afterwards, following up on the results of the cables and the United States uh, diplomatic efforts, including our uh, financial and other democracy building efforts in the years afterwards, and the ways in which America's work in and immediately after the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia and then in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia uh, made possible today's democracy uh, in those two nations, but also uh, some of the failures of American dipl diplomacy uh, that seeded some of the challenges that those two vibrant democracies, but uh, like democracies everywhere, uh, uh, facing challenges, how America was responsible uh, to some extent for both the ups and the downs. Uh, before we turn to a discussion of the themes of the book and the meaning of American diplomatic leadership today, uh, which I uh, submit to you is flagging in the era of COVID. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of the individuals who uh, were my co-authors, uh, my collaborators on the book. Uh, that includes uh, my fellow contributors, Kelsey Landau, Dr. Mikulas Peshta, Narel Gilchrist, and David Fishman. Uh, as well as uh, 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 Teddy Becker Jacob, an unacknowledged but uh, fantastic uh, contributor to the book. Uh, the editorial team at the Brookings Institution Press, what a pleasure it has been to work with them. Uh, Bill Finan, Cecilia Gonzalez, and Elliot Beard. My Brookings colleagues, uh, uh, um, John Allen, Daryl West, Suzanne Maloney, Tom Wright, Letty Davalos, so many others uh, who have uh, made the uh, book possible. Uh, and uh, uh, all of our uh, donors and contributors, um, including those who support the progress in the Open Society Project, which this book is a product of, none more than Dan Berger. I want to thank uh, Dan Berger of Philadelphia 
incredible American philanthropist for his uh, support. Um, and with that, uh, I'll remind everyone that for social media on this event, you can tag hashtag Democracies Defenders. Uh, you can submit questions for speakers by emailing events at brookings.edu or on Twitter by tweeting uh, at brookings.gov. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, and uh, uh, introduce uh, Jeff and Alina before turning it back over to them. Uh, Alina, uh, Dr. Polyakova uh, is president and CEO of SIPA, the Center for European Poly Policy Analysis, a former colleague of mine at Brookings, where she was a fellow and the director for global democracy and emerging technology. Uh, at the institution. Previously, she also served in her distinguished career as Director of Research for Europe and Eurasia at the Atlantic Council. Uh, she's an expert on transatlantic relations uh, with deep experience on European politics, Russian foreign policy, and uh, digital technologies. Her most recent book is The Dark Side of European Integration, uh, Alina will be joined on the panel today uh, by my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Gedman, the editor-in-chief of the American Interest and the CEO of the TAI Group. Uh, uh, Jeff has also been president and CEO of the London-based Legatum Institute, uh, of the Aspen Institute in Berlin. I got to know him when uh, he served as president and CEO of Radio Free Europe, um, Radio Liberty, uh, and was a uh, wonderful, we, we overlapped and was just a wonderful partner in advancing uh, democracy, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, and truth uh, uh, in Europe and around the world. Uh, he's the author and editor of several books, including The Hidden Hand, Gorbachev and the Collapse of East Germany. Thank you, Jeff and Alina, for being with us today to celebrate Democracy's Defenders. Again, folks, you can see, forgive me, you can see the link, I hope, at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'm passing it to Alina to moderate our discussion. Well, thank you, Norm. It's really just such a pleasure to be back um, in a virtual format together with you and, and Jeff. Um, after all the work we did together on uh, trying to understand uh, how to push back against democratic backsliding. And I know we will get to that, to what's happening today, and certainly some of the uh, major questions and concerns uh, that many, uh, including yourself and Jeff, have raised about some of the recent expansions we've seen to uh, really lock down uh, executive control in so many societies, uh, not just in Europe, um, as a result of the current crisis and where that may lead us. But before we get to that, I think uh, what your book does so wonderfully um, is that it reminds us that the fight for democracy is a, is a fight, that it's not something that we can take for granted, um, and that uh, the United States and U.S. diplomats in particular played such a critical role in what ultimately became uh, the greatest democratization process that we saw um, culminating with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Um, but before we get to all that modern stuff, uh, let's let's go back to the, the time period the book really starts with. So Norm, you mentioned um, all of these rich cables that you gathered for the new book. I think it's so interesting when you do this kind of research. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got your hands on them, uh, what they're about, and what do you think we can learn from this, uh, from the specific cables that are featured in the book? Uh, thanks, Alina. Um, I got my hands on them uh, when I was researching, after I left the embassy uh, and came to Brookings uh, in uh, 2014. And uh, I was researching the um, uh, previous book I wrote, History of the Past Hundred Years, as uh, seen through the windows of the magnificent uh, uh, residence where the US ambassador in Prague lives, where I lived. Uh, and uh, it, that, that 100 years exactly paralleled America's increased uh, engagement uh, in Europe 
uh, starting with uh, Wilsonian uh, entry into uh, World War I. And um, uh, in order to write the um, uh, chapters on the end of the Cold War, I had to research that period. Uh, and uh, I realized that um, when I was looking, there had been a batch of cables that were declassified. But in reading that initial batch of cables, I realized that some of the most interesting cables had never been released. And I called my old friends at the State Department and asked why. And, they explained to me that um, uh, that uh, 50 or so cables uh, contain some of the most sensitive information and were not suitable for release. So there were a variety of reasons. That was one of the reasons. And um, I uh, pointed out that we would soon be coming up on the 30 year mandatory release uh, of documents um, documents are supposed to be released. And I uh, uh, triggered the bureaucratic process, uh, pushed it forward so that uh, uh, there, there are a variety of legal vehicles. Uh, I ended up using one called mandatory declassification review. And just in the nick of time uh, to check them uh, before my last book came out, I got a big stack of these documents, but I barely scratched the surface. They were so full of riches uh, that I decided to, with the kind encouragement of Brookings Press, my publisher, Bill Finan, I decided to devote a whole book to them. And in terms of what they're about, Alina and Jeff and all of you who are watching, what they're about is um, the uh, secret sauce of uh, American leadership um, in that hundred year period started starting with the with Wilson's realization uh, that democracy uh, was not an American matter. It was not a European matter. It was a transatlantic matter. There are two anchors to American democracy to democracy in the United States and Europe. And all of the things that made America uh, so admired that made us the so-called leader of the free world, that made the State Department the most admired diplomatic institution in the world, are on exhibit in these cables as American diplomats from Ambassador Shirley Temple Black on down attempted to make sure that uh, the forces of democracy succeeded in Czechoslovakia, but to do it without taking American ownership. The genius of American democracy support is that we inspire uh, those who believe in democracy in any given country uh, to do their very best. So they met, those diplomats met privately with the communist regime and warned them that uh, violence uh, would lead uh, to serious consequences. They met privately with the dissidents and talk to them about how to proceed, how far to go and how fast. They let the world know that they were watching. The ambassador even personally went to demonstrations at risk and life of life and limb. They wrote these uh, uh, 50 some brilliant uh, cables, each one of which is like a uh, newspaper or magazine story packed with detail and analysis, just the, the sheer caliber of the intellect and the quality uh, and the desire to get to the truth so that folks back in Washington who were making the decisions could be informed on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis about what was unfolding in the Rev Velvet Revolution in the streets. So those, and they finally, the, the cables shine with moral leadership the determination to do the right thing, irrespective of the consequences. And that notion of America's role in the world, of uh, the international nature of democracy, the loyalty to truth, uh, morality as a leadership trait, and just uh, sheer intelligence and goodness uh, uh, all come through. And that is the real story of these cables and how America supported the Velvet Revolution and the rebirth of democracy in Czechoslovakia. Thank you, Norm. Um, you know, one of the things that the book really highlights, I think, is is you know a few lines of of story that 
are both very much, I think, untold um, in some ways, not just because the records were classified, as he said until recently, uh, but also because we often see 1989 and then what transpired in Central Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union as a sort of fait accompli, uh, when of course it was not. It took uh, blood, uh, blood, sweat, and tears uh, on the part of many um, US diplomats and civil society leaders um, local civil society leaders in all these countries to make this happen. Uh, so Jeff, let me uh, pull you into this conversation a bit. Um, the book uh, tells the story, as Norm said, of the US role in the Velvet Revolution itself, uh, but also traces a line from what happened following 1989 um, in terms of the programs and reforms in both the Czech Republic and Slovakia after the separation. Um, some were backed by the US um, and how that led to a really complex uh, state of democracy in both countries today. Uh, Jeff, like Norm, you spent a long period of time living in the Czech Republic uh, while you were serving as editor-in-chief of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So you know the country well. How would you assess the present state of Czech democracy and democracy in Central and Eastern Europe more broadly? I am unmuted now. Alina, thank you. And, and it's a pleasure being with you, Alina, and you, Norm, and big, big congratulations on this book and, and Kelsey and your other uh, colleagues who made it possible. It's impressive. Uh, Alina, let me, let me respond uh, with two points. They're, they're bookends, if you will. To the first point, if I may, uh, the, the book is, is fascinating. And it's very valuable in, in so many different ways because it's a, for me at any rate, it's a snapshot, but a fluid one and a dynamic one of a period, you alluded to that Alina, where the outcomes were not certain and nothing was actually preordained. And you have this window on diplomats, but through the cables, dissidents, citizens, other actors and players trying to shape a destiny. It's clear about how much was unclear. Diplomats trying to ascertain and establish public mood, motives, players and trajectory. Very interesting, I think. And it, it's also the case that there are things that were, we were able to control and things we were less able to control. So just from a historical point of view, to have that window on a case study like this, an important, a monumental case study. Norm, I think you've done us a real service and, and provided real value. To, <clears throat> to what you asked about, Alina, I would go to the afterword and what you provide for us toward the end of the book, Norm, and I'm paraphrasing you, but, but there are many things that happen through revolution and through the demise of communism, which we applaud and brought so much freedom to so many people who lived uh, under so much tyranny for decades. But, but then we realized after that point and subsequently that there are certain things, you say, Norm, that economic liberalization is essential but not sufficient. There are a number of things we've learned are essential but not sufficient. It's important to have fair and free elections. It's important to have a multi-party system. It's important to have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And to you, Norm, toward the end of your book, Economic Liberalization, but, but to, to build and grow a democracy has to do with institutions, sinking deep roots, being durable, and also culture, habits, values, behaviors, attitudes. And I think we've learned in a word, Alina, that for people who lived under communism for four decades, or in the case of the Soviet Union, seven decades, to flip, to switch, to enter a new world and a new mindset, it takes time, it has to be negotiated, and we, we don't get to impose or dictate or set the agenda. It has to be indigenous, it has to be authentic, and that's a process. And I think we're in the midst of a, a difficult moment in the process 30 years later. 
Thank you, Jeff. So let me pick up with the point you are we're wrapping us up with, and then I'll take it over to Norm with the same question. And that's the point you make about the authenticity of the domestic uh, civil society movements um, that are really the key actors uh, when it comes to ensuring democratic resilience, uh, maintaining the uh, integrity of democratic institutions and really pushing back uh, during moments when uh, democracies are facing incredible challenges. And certainly the crisis we're going through now is not the first challenge that we've seen in the post uh, 1989 period. Um, I think it's safe to say that you know, civil society is a particularly salient force in the Czech Republic. Um, some, some of you who may be tuning in I may have missed this, but late last year, protesters gathered on the eve of the 30th anniversary of the Velo Revolution and called for the resignation of the prime minister over some fraud allegations that were being uh, reported on at the time. So given this tension that we often see between domestic civil society forces and the ruling governments in power with which of course, the United States uh, has to have diplomatic relations with. Um, you know, now all of these countries are NATO allies, they're EU member states, uh, the European Union um, and Europe more broadly is a key and core US ally um, that we depend on for so much in terms of ensuring our own prosperity and our own security in the United States. Uh, but given this tension, um, how can the U.S. continue to support uh, those domestic, authentic actors in the, for, in the world that we find ourselves in today? Is that for me? I'm going to take it to Jeff first, and then I'll take it back to you, Norm. So, so <clears throat> Alina, th there are things that we do uh, as Americans in and outside of government and through private sector and NGOs. And, and I think in my view, uh, democracy uh, is better thought of uh, as a process rather than an event. And so if you permit me just one moment, we live in a great democracy, the United States of America. It, it was uh, started with a birth defect, uh, a terrible one called slavery. We've had in this country segregation, Vietnam, Watergate, the assassination of JFK, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And today a moment of considerable polarization and contention that involves many different issues. So if we look at other countries at other points of transition, we should not be surprised that there are flaws and blemishes and twists and turns and setbacks. But, but I think for us to answer your question directly, if we believe that institutions are important and checks and balances are important and things like independent courts in that context are important, let's say so and offer support of various means. If we believe that vibrant civil society is important and, and values such as pluralism and tolerance and respect for diversity, th then let's say so. And then let's put our money where our mouth is and support the, the, the appropriate NGO actors or media actors or political forces. So I'll stop there. The norm, over to you, same question. What, what can the US do now uh, to support these uh, democratic forces? Well, uh, Alina, the... Um in no particular order. And there is a void uh, in uh, US leadership at the top levels, uh, the president, the secretary of state, um, some of the more um, uh, uh, Trumpian uh, ambassadors, um, although they, current ambassadors uh, to the Czech Republic, uh, current ambassador to Czech Republic is very, very good. Um, the, I'm thinking of Ambassador Grinnell in Germany, who then uh, became the uh, acting director of national intelligence here. 
uh, reportedly headed over to an acting role at the uh, Secret Service. Um, uh, there's a void at the, at the top because the message that is sent, both a direct message, an overt message, but also the message of example is not one that is supportive of democracy. Um, that leaves others uh, to fill that role. And there still is a tremendous cadre of career ambassadors who uh, promote democratic values um, and uh, uh, together with all their colleagues at the State Department, the other agencies who serve in our embassies. Um, uh, so that has continued. Uh, Non-executive actors become even more important. Um, uh, members of Congress, and in particular, uh, Speaker Pelosi, um, who uh, uh, has a status uh, around the world almost akin uh, to a head of state has stepped up in, in, in to a much greater extent than was the case in either uh, by Democratic or Republican predecessors before because of this void. So you see her traveling the world, leading bipartisan uh, delegations, uh, emerging, for example, at the uh, as the leading American voice at things like the. Uh, 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 75th uh, commemoration anniversaries of events uh, marking uh, milestones in World War II or uh, the Munich Security Conference. And then the third thing I would say is there's an even greater role for civil society. Uh, and that's where the three of us come in a little bit. Jeff and I, of course, co-chair the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. Bipartisan, and Alina, you're very active with the TDWG, which is a co-sponsor of today's event. Uh, we're a bipartisan group of uh, former uh, diplomats, uh, 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 government officials, uh, thinkers, writers, scholars, analysts, um, uh, who value the transatlantic relationship, who see democracy uh, as a good in itself, but also as a security, critical security issue. And we are very vocal in speaking out uh, and we know the European governments uh, listen when we speak out about democracy because sometimes uh, we've gotten complaints from their diplomatic representatives here in the United States. So it's important for us to speak out about what's happening in places like Hungary, uh, uh, in Poland, uh, and elsewhere uh, around the continent. And of course, to speak also about uh, issues with democracy in the other anchor of the security relationship and the democratic one, United States. Thank you, Norm. I just want to take a second to remind all of you who are tuned in to send us your questions via email or submit them via Twitter. Uh, want to hear from those of you um, who are listening in, any questions you might have for both Norm and Jeff about the wonderful book, but just about what's happening in the world today. So I promised we talk about the current situation in a little, more, a little bit more detail. Certainly uh, the coronavirus COVID-19 crisis is top of mind uh, for everyone um, for many different reasons, um, including the public health reasons, but also of course the kinds of economic effects the crisis is having. And um, it's also having political effects, which uh, in recent weeks, uh, many of our colleagues have also been raising the sort of the alarm um, around the the reality that um, globally, in at least 84 countries, according to a recent Freedom House report, uh, there have been various kinds of measures imposed to curb freedom of speech, civil liberties, other kinds of rights uh, the citizens enjoy, uh, and of course, there's a big question mark as to whether the crisis is being used. Uh, by some perhaps um, authoritarian-minded leaders um, to continue uh, this kind of executive control um, and to kind of chip away at democratic checks and balances. And I, I want to get both of your perspectives on that. Um, you know, obviously, uh, one country in Central Eastern Europe that often comes to mind and certainly receives a huge amount of criticism um, is, is Hungary. Um, under the control of uh, the current Fidesz government and Prime Minister Orban, um, who has used emergency powers to place limits of 
on freedom of speech and repress uh, civil society. Um, recently, the, the government did announce um, that there would be an end date to those emergency powers. Uh, but certainly there's a big question as to what are sort of the lingering effects um, that we're going to see um, in Central Eastern Europe, especially, but across the world uh, more broadly when it comes to democratic progress. We are already in sort of a democratic sag, if you will, across the world. Um, so how will this crisis, you think, affect um, that trajectory? Or will this be a moment when perhaps um, people and citizens uh, will stop taking our rights and freedoms uh, for granted and we'll see greater pushback. Uh, so Jeff, maybe let me just start with you. Any piece of that you wanna pick up, long-term ramifications, Hungary specifically, uh, just what are your thoughts on how the crisis is manifesting itself in terms of the democratic trajectory we're seeing across the world and Central Eastern Europe specifically? So, so Alina, thank you. I'll, I'll share a few brief thoughts and then I'm eager to hear what uh, what Norm ha has to say and how he'll address it. To, to context, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that a number of things are happening all at once in the last decade or so. And it's not just in Central Europe. Uh, we had a global financial crisis in 2008 it had its effects and has had impact on attitude toward capitalism and global capitalism. We had an election in 2016, where in the primaries, the two primary candidates, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, may have been oh so different, but they were the two protest candidates. They were the two anti-establishment candidates or throwing rocks at Wall Street in Washington, if you will. Uh, I think that if you look at what's happening in Central Europe, it fits into a context of crisis of confidence to some extent in democracy and capitalism's ability to deliver or lift those left out or left behind by developments in technology and globalization broadly. That's point one or basket one. Point two or basket two, Alina, in my view, is the following. Uh, where there are vacuums, vacuums get filled. Or where there's a crisis, it's an opportunity for this one, that one, or the other. And so enter someone like Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, who I think is many things at once. I think that he is a conservative culture warrior, in the US meaning of the word or expression. I think he is uh, corrupt or kleptocratic or self-dealing in the American sense of those words. And I think he is a shrewd, calculating power consolidator. And so in a global context and in the context of Central Europe and Hungary, where he saw that he could self-deal self-enrich and consolidate power, he has done so. I only hasten to add, he didn't come from nowhere like Donald Trump. And he's not without support inside Hungary like Donald Trump in the United States. So I think to, to fix the problem, which I do think is real and I think is illiberal and I think is clearly authoritarian in tendency means that we have to operate on a number of different fronts and a number of different levels. So Norm, same question to you. Well, I would add to the, um, uh, a couple of notes uh, to the uh, Hungary analysis and then broaden it out a little bit uh, regionally. Um, you know, we too often focus on the, uh, the challenges, it's the threats and the damage that gets attention. We don't always um, uh, uh, appreciate, uh, uh, as you point out, that now we'll see if he follows through, but that Orban has capped, he's put an end date 
on these emergencies. I don't think he's doing that out of the goodness of his heart. I believe he would love to have them continue forever. Uh, it's the it's that um, endurance of democracy, that democratic energy uh, that uh, that Jeff was alluding to, that forces uh, the hand of people like Orban. We had another very good example of that recently. Uh, Jeff, Jeff and I were involved on behalf of the TDWG, the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, uh, with the Polish elections in the midst of the coronavirus. We feared that the uh, ruling Law and Justice Party would take advantage of the uh, crisis to insist the elections take place and benefit from a depressed uh, turnout. Uh, there was an international outcry. Uh, uh, various people spoke out all over the world and in Poland, where it's one of the lessons of democracy's defenders. It's the home uh, 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 outcry that matters the most. The, the, the domestic fight for democracy and the rest of us have to think, and, and in our conversations at TDWG, we bolstered this, how can we support those who are fighting for democracy on the front lines? Lo and behold, in response to national and international pressure, the uh, Polish regime backed off. There are very worrying signs, uh, particularly around uh, judges that continue to be alarming in Poland, a resurgence of anti-Semitism. Uh, but at least in this one instance of the election in the time of Corona, democratic energy helped cause uh, uh, a, a more democratic outcome, the postponement of the elections. So thank you, Norm. I want to start to bring in some of our audience questions. Uh, many are already rolling in. And we have about 20 minutes left in our conversation. So I want to make sure that we get some um, here on the table. Um, so we have one from Andrew, who I think you know well, Norm, uh, your, your very own former uh, research assistant, uh, who asks, um, I'd be curious to hear how these cables complement and expand upon those published previously in the Prague, Washington, Prague volume. Norm, over to you. Well, uh, hello to Andrew Keneally, my former research assistant, now getting his PhD uh, at Duke. And uh, I tried to get Andrew to be a co-author on this book, uh, Alina, but uh, he, he dodged me. He's written a very uh, important piece himself on the lessons of the year and more broadly uh, that is uh, coming out shortly. Um, Andrew, I think, uh, as you well know, um, the cables add um, a, a dimension uh, to the previous, the previously existing cables uh, because uh, they teach us, if I had to pick one lesson, they teach us that the outcome was not foreordained. That uh, right up until the time uh, that uh, power was transferred at the end of the year in those two crucial months of November and December. It could have gone the other way. One of the most important gleanings from these cables that readers will see uh, is that um, uh, there was a continued worry about uh, violence from the regime. Uh, this was the era of Tiananmen Square. Uh, other uh, communist transitions, although they happened, were not so velvet. Uh, and there could have been uh, violence uh, here too, uh, as happened elsewhere in, uh, in Eastern Europe in the period. So um, the very skilled uh, behind the scenes diplomacy of the embassy, ambassador in the embassy helped avert that. Uh, I will say the very public voice, you had a former child movie star Shirley Temple, now Shirley Temple Black, who was the ambassador. Her very public identity and the fact that the world was watching and that the communist regime would be held accountable if there were violence, I think that comes out in the cables and her efforts to focus world attention on the situation in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then uh, above all though, I don't, I want to uh, uh, emphasize 
Uh, all of that was done in support of the Czech and Slovak uh, people who were on the front lines. Uh, so the cables also emphasize, highlight uh, the importance of uh, letting the Czechs and Slovaks lead in the fight for their own democracy. Thank you, Norm. And Jeff, let me take the next question over to you. Um, it is from Jeffrey, but that's not why I'm taking the question over to you. Um, the question is this, uh, what lessons from the Velvet Revolution can be applied to today's battle against populism and nativism? And I think here's the interesting point. Uh, with the backlash to this backlash, meaning populism itself is a backlash, um, but now we're seeing a backlash to that backlash um, occurring from in civil society. Uh, but Jeffrey says it's not coming in Western Europe, but in Central Europe. Isn't that ironic? What do you think accounts for this outcome? Um, th thank you, Alina, and to, to the question, Jeffrey, thank you. Um, first, to the roots of the problem, uh, I, I think there's no one size fits all analysis. And as the question suggests, uh, it can differ in regions, it can differ in countries. But let me just start with the Czech Republic. The, the populist surge in the Czech Republic uh, began a couple or so years ago at a moment where there was low unemployment, relatively high growth, a small manageable immigrant population, and no refugees, or five refugees, or 25 refugees. That, that's that piece. Uh, across the border in Germany, there was a refugee crisis, and the uh, admittance of about a million refugees several years ago, that's a big deal. But, but otherwise, in a country relatively cohesive, with decent growth, and decently low uh, unemployment, and uh, a bad history with extremism in many serious and severe ways, but we've witnessed the rise of the AFD, a populist right-wing party, a hodgepodge of different things, but that has come onto the scene in a relatively short amount of time, has established itself, it goes up and down in the polls, but it doesn't look like it's gonna disappear. So to answer the question, uh, gosh, let me give you a very unsatisfactory a reply to Jeffrey who, who answered, what, what are the lessons that can be learned? Uh, one is let's work really hard on our description and diagnosis of what the problem is and the roots, however multifaceted. And back to Norm's fine book and the cables, the diplomats are always trying to figure out, are we working with a complete data set? Are we seeing everything? Do we have 2020 vision? Okay, we don't. But, but how do we make sure that we're looking at this from all actors and all angles? The second thing, to, to go back to the book and the cables, to, to combat these things, it's a mix of carrots and sticks and short-term and medium to longer term. One can't do everything at once. And whatever it is that we're seeing, Jeffrey and others, that's happening today in Central Europe, if we're focused on that region, uh, it's still a snapshot. We're involved in a film or a novel with multiple characters and multiple plots. Something came before and something will come after. So, so I think somehow we have to contextualize, get a bigger picture and make sure we're describing the problem properly. And as I suggested, Germany is different from the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic is different from pick a country, Great Britain, and how it's Brexited. But, but in each instance, to, to come up with a one-size-fits-all, best practice is very important, but a one-size-fits-all lessons learned, I'm very interested and I'm very cautious. Thank you, Jeff. Um, no, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on that question, but let me throw another question on top of it. Um, and I think this is a very relevant one for young people today, especially those graduating right now, coming out of college and considering career opportunities perhaps in US diplomacy. And this is from Julia who says, do you have recommendations for young adults in the US with an interest in national service, uh, diplomacy, intelligence community, et cetera, but feel hesitant about serving in these institutions since 2016? 
Um, is it unreasonable to pursue such career paths? And if so, is there a scenario that would cause you to change your mind about that in the future? Norm? Well, uh, <clears throat> I have a long running uh, debate on this question, uh, although it's principally focused on the senior levels of government with some of my um, uh, uh, colleagues and friends who uh, disagree on whether uh, individuals of good faith uh, in the most uh, senior political echelons should join uh, the Trump administration. Uh, are they doing more good or harm by lending their good name uh, to that profoundly flawed enterprise? I'm of the view that, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we have a um, madman at the uh, controls uh, of the plane, so we'd better try to get a responsible uh, co-pilot in there. So I want to see as many, uh, as many good people as possible go into the enterprise, and, and uh, they actually can make a difference to how policy is conducted. That is even more true, Julia, uh, for younger folks. I would encourage everyone uh, to come in uh, to the administration, one, because I believe there is going to be a reckoning and a repudiation uh, of, uh, uh, of the lack of leadership that we're seeing. Um, and when that happens, sooner or later, we're, and I think it's going to be sooner, we are going to need the best young people. So beat the line. Now is the time, if you're interested in diplomacy, the intelligence community, federal law enforcement, public policy, but you feel hesitant, now is the time to sign up. We need you. Uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a huge enterprise. And uh, when uh, we hit the ejector seat on that pilot, we're going to need some very good co-pilots to help land the plane. So please do come aboard. I just want to emphasize what you just said, Norm, um, getting this question sometimes from young people graduating uh, college right now, these very um, unfortunate circumstances and asking themselves this question uh, that many have asked themselves in the past about, uh, especially the professional career track when it comes to being a service officer, civil servant. And I agree with you. I say get in now. <laughs> Get in now while there will be, you know, opportunities in, down the road. Um, if you're a foreign service officer, you're not in Washington most of the uh, time in your career, anyways. So you don't have to worry about anything you might you might think about any of the ramifications you might experience. Um, so I just agree with you. I think we we need to build the bench, and we need to have the best and the brightest uh, defending uh, U.S. diplomacy um, across the world because at the end of the day. Uh, the U.S. has been a force for the, the spread of democracy across the world uh, and more, more than one occasion, let's just say that. Now, Jeff, I don't know if you want to comment on that question about uh, what young people should be considering or thinking about joining a public service. Um, and let me throw another one on top of that. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit from a question uh, coming from Chandler, um, who asks, you know, if we view, if we see what's happening today in a broader historical perspective, so uh, more of the kind of long tail of what's happening today, um, do you think that uh, the President Trump's policies have been permanently damaging to transatlantic democracy and institutions? So, so, Alina, thank you. I'll, I'll say something about Chandler's question and also go back to Julia for a moment. Um, I'm not a supporter of the president, and <clears throat> I think damage is being done. Uh, do I think it's permanent? No. There's one of these, gosh, which one? Someone will text. But one of these old movies with Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon, I even forget what the context is where Jack Lemon says to Walter Matthau, it's too late. And Walter Matthau says, 
it's not too late. It's never too late. That's why they invented death. So we've been through a lot in this country. Good heavens. I've alluded to some of those big things that we've struggled with and against and overcome. I take the problem seriously. I think the hill to climb is a big one. But, but no, I don't think any damage being done right now is creating obstacles that are insurmountable. And that takes us back to, to Julia's comment. And, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate its sincerity because it's not a great time to join the Foreign Service, for example, for a variety of reasons. But, but, but again, and I don't mean to be at all glib because I do take it seriously and people's time and resources and, and commitment to studies and professional development, the foreign service exam, it's all very important. But, but this whole panel is about Norm's book and Defenders of Democracy. And thank God, if I may say, we live in a democracy. So if you don't like Donald Trump, we have elections in November. If it doesn't produce the outcome you like, we have elections again in four years. He's not president for life or the next 20 years or the next 10 years. Now, a bunch of other things are going on and I don't minimize how complicated and difficult it is, but, but as individuals, and, and I hearten and second what Norm said, beat the line and we all have a way to do some kind of contribution and service. I would say, Norman Lean, when people come to me for help in job hunting, and sometimes young professionals, we all can find it daunting. I always say to them, don't forget you're looking for one job, not 17 or 325, one. So, so as individuals on this call, if you're thinking about this, that, or the other career path, you're thinking about what you can do for a meaningful career where you can make a contribution. And the rest, let it be a little bit, and it will develop, I think, in a very positive way. Take it, take it from me and Jeff, because between the two of us, we've had at least 25 jobs. I mean, maybe we're not very qualified to give, a, to give job advice, Jeff. We can't hold down a job. I've had, I, I just counted in my head, I've had 14 since I graduated from college. Stop counting. For both our sakes. Yeah, that I will should be in that game <laughs> in the job counting game. Um, well, let me let me just ask maybe one final question before before we wrap up. Um, and this one comes uh, from Sejong, uh, and it, it really brings in a, a more of a geopolitical uh, perspective into the conversation we're having, uh, having to do with China, of course. Um, and let me let me just paraphrase the question: um, How, what is the appropriate strategy for the United States to pursue, uh, given the state of the transatlantic alliance today and the state of democracy that we've been discussing, um, to continue to push global democratic government governance while still outweighing China's growing authoritarian influence? Um, Norm, thoughts? Well, the um, uh, rivalry um, on the geopolitical stage, including in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, although you see it all over the world, the rivalry between America and China is um, one of the signal challenges uh, to democracy because the Chinese really do pose an alternative model and they back that model uh, with uh, substantial uh, financial might, uh, willing, often willing to spend in places, including in the Czech Republic, um, uh, in ways that uh, the United States uh, government uh, no longer does. I'll say parenthetically, one of the, to me, the single biggest thing I learned from the book uh, was, Jeff alluded to this earlier, was the pitfalls of those kinds of government investments and the way the United States decided it was going to anchor the new democracy. Maybe this has a lesson for dealing with China. The United States decided it would anchor the new democracy in uh, Czechoslovakia by uh, spending to uh, uh, prop up the or to build 
a market economy on the idea that that was a necessary and sufficient condition for democracy. It turned out not to work quite that way. And the investments that the United States made in the radical, uh, the shock therapy and coupon privatization uh, of the post velvet revolution years ended up seeding a fair amount of corruption that afflicts uh, democracy in the Czech Republic and Slovakia today. So um, to bring that around to the China example, um, I think that the uh, Chinese uh, spending uh, is an overrated threat. Um, uh, you know, the America, despite the blemishes we've taken on, we've done that before. We withdrew from the world stage. We were uh, in a terrible uh, depression in the 1930s. And much as people are casting an eye towards China now, people were looking towards Soviet Russia, where Stalin was claiming uh, not just endurance, but year over year GDP dramatic growth as a result, he said, of his superior system. Uh, in, in the long run in history, um, and this is a lesson of democracy's defenders, um, in the long run, the power of democracy, the power of the hopes and aspirations of the people when they're liberated for political exercise uh, to, um, uh, to, to exercise their rights of speech uh, and inquiry, uh, and yes, the power of economic, genuine economic uh, uh, market competition, all of the, the, the baskets, the, the, the power to have uh, a protection of the rule of law, all of the things that democracy offers that China uh, denies and compromises, uh, uh, either um, uh, offering half measures, uh, bastardized versions or none at all, including in those market investments. The Czechs had a tremendous shock uh, when the Chinese government uh, took over a private investment that a, a Chinese company had made. And suddenly the Czechs found that there was a, a Chinese government owner uh, for this uh, business in the Czech Republic. So I think the system will endure and I think we will overcome the momentary lapses uh, our best days, uh, both as American democratic and diplomatic leaders and for transatlantic democracy lie ahead of us. Thank you, Norm. Jeff, uh, 30 second response and final word. Sure, insofar as we have a quarrel, it's not with the people of China, it's with the regime of China. Democracy matters. And second of all, we're not the only ones in the room. And I think as much as we can do to confer, consult, and listen to our other democratic allies in Europe and in the region, including Japan and Taiwan and others, will be very, very valuable. Thank you, Jeff. That was very succinct. Um, I want to take us out of the discussion. I'll give Norm the final goodbye. But before I do that, I want to remind everyone, this is the book. Um, it is available for purchase um, at the Brookings Institution Press and elsewhere on the internet. Um, and it is a wonderful read to remind us all of some hard learned lessons uh, about the, how democracy was really won and fought for uh, by the United States uh, working closely together with our allies on the ground. And look at this if you need a reminder of why all those values and principles continue to be so important today. So Norm, let me hand it over to you. Thank you for the book, to you and your colleagues. Thank you, Jeff, um, for adding your perspective. Fascinating uh, history both of you have had with uh, Czech Republic especially. Couldn't have thought of a better conversation uh, partner um, than, than you, Jeff, and of course you, Norm. So Norm, final, final word over to you. I'll try to emulate Jeff's brevity. Um, thank you, Alina. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks to everybody at Brookings for putting this on and the Brookings Press for the book, to my co-authors. The link to the book should be at the bottom of your screens, everybody. If not, Democracy's Defenders, available uh, 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 at the Brookings Press website and online everywhere. Um, the uh, 
goes without saying that the void uh, of American leadership, the behavior of America uh, at, the, at the top levels in the era of COVID has betrayed every principle we write about in democracies, defenders. Um, but if there's one thing that I took away from this book, it is the endurance and the power of democratic energy uh, and uh, transatlantic democracy in its full form uh, will be back and better than ever. I predict before we know it, we've come back from dark places before on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in the uh, roughly 300 year history, uh, 300 year plus history uh, of uh, modern uh, democracy and we will do it again. Read Democracy's Defenders to find out a little bit about uh, why uh, the past is prologue. And with that, thank you for joining us and goodbye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.